live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to the second live episode of Surviving the Survivor today. Obviously, earlier today, we had Donna Adelson's first appearance, and now we are back. Uh, we're going to discuss an important topic, which is perjury and how it might impact Wendy Adelson and a possible indictment as a result of that. Uh, first, for those who are fairly new to the story, uh, Charlie Adelson, of course, uh, the wealthy South Florida periodontist, he managed to elude justice for nine plus years in the 2014 killing of Florida state law professor Dan Markell. Well, he was convicted a week ago this past Monday on all counts uh, in Dan Markell's murder. Charlie Adelson's sentencing is set for December 12th, 12-12, where he's expected to be sent to state prison for the rest of his natural life. And in December, we're going to get a case hearing on Donna Adelson. That's because exactly one week after Charlie Adelson's conviction, the matriarch of the Adelson family, Donna Adelson, was arrested and she's in custody. She spent a week behind bars in Miami. Not a fun place to be in that uh, particular jail. Yesterday, she was transported up to Leon County. The irony is thick. She wanted her grandchildren out of Tallahassee. That's where she is tonight, along with her son. And tonight's topic revolves around Wendy Adelson. Um, is the stuff that she said on the stand going to be used against her despite being granted immunity? We're going to discuss immunity uh, with some really bright minds. First off, you know his face and name well. Famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen. He's going to be appearing on Good Morning America tomorrow. He's a partner in the firm Jansen and Davis that bears his name. He's handled all sorts of complex civil, administrative, and criminal litigation. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor, so he knows knows both sides of the defense. Karen Cipher, she's been on the show, one of the smarter people that I know, and also understated. She's a close friend of the Markells and co-manager of the advocacy group Justice for Dan Markell, which is what this should all be about. Karen, as I said, very smart, is also a Ph.D. in public policy and is full time faculty at Florida State University and a partner at Sachs Media. And as you know, we only have the best guests in true crime. John Singer, certainly one of them. He is co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, a graduate of the Georgetown uh, University Law School. He was designated as a super uh, lawyer in New York every single year since the beginning of time. And uh, he also does tons of TV appearances. Please, a quick reminder, you can support us on Patreon or YouTube if you can't do that and you're in the car. Please listen to us on audio uh, on an audio platform like Spotify and or Apple. It really goes a long way in helping us uh, to continue to bring you uh, these types of shows. Uh, right off the bat here, you see Karen is great. I uh, saw someone else saying great guests. It's not just a tagline. It's a reality. We bring you the best guests in true crime. A reminder, tomorrow at 5.30, you're going to hear from both Ruth and Phil Markell, Dan Markell's parents. Ruth is going to come on for the full hour at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. She's going to talk about why she is thankful this year for justice. I've been asking people to send me uh, some tweets with questions. It's at Podcast STS, at Podcast STS tweets for the Markell family. Phil Markell is going to do something a little shorter uh, and quicker. Uh, just that's what he would like to do. And obviously we are going to um, defer to the Adelsons on that. And then Thursday, we're having at least two former friends of Charlie Adelson. So again, if you have questions for either of them, possibly a third guest, send us questions at podcast STS. Now, there's not an elephant in the room. There's a, a little bit of a mouse because, uh, honestly, uh, I'm not that bothered by it, but I know it's been happening. A lot of accusations are being tossed and flung at Tim Jansen, and, and I don't like it one bit. 
um, some people that we ourselves gave a much bigger platform to to help grow their shows. Um, they've been taking some nasty shots at Tim, and I'd like to think that it's out of emotion. Um, we are going to continue to offer our platform up to other shows because uh, that's what we want to do. Steve Cohen, otherwise known as Meve Moen, uh, he is our fearless producer, our booking producer. He always says that a rising tide lifts all ships, and we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, derail ourselves from that sort of uh, thinking. But it, it is disappointing. Um, I have known Tim for a long time. We finally met in person while covering the trial in Tallahassee. He opened both his home and his office to us without knowing us from a hole in the wall other than you know doing the show a bunch of times and he also opened that office to a lot of other people um, who were seemingly there to support the Markells some of those people don't seem too appreciative today uh, he's been nothing Tim has but gracious to us and after meeting his wife and daughter I also realized what a good husband and father he is the guy has character and integrity and on this show the claims that he has made about Wendy are the same claims that have been made by guys like John Singer, uh, who's a very savvy defense attorney, made by people like the founder of Justice for Dan Markell, Jason Solomon, even Florida State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg, and David Latt, who's another legal scholar. Really no different than any of the of those guys, but everyone is going after Tim, uh, questioning some of uh, uh, what he has said about evidence linking Wendy into this hideous crime. And he did all that before uh, Charlie's conviction and before Donna's arrest. As recently as today, Tim said he thinks that Donna's cell phone could be a huge factor uh, in taking down Wendy. So, uh, Tim, thank you for everything you've done. Just two questions to put out on the record there, and then I'm moving on from this for good. Number one, were you ever paid by any of the Adelsons or anyone in their orbit for any of the commentary that you provided? That is absolutely a joke. Um, I hate to even respond to such stupid comments. But you know what? When people, that's what's wrong with society today. When they don't like the message, they attack the messenger, right? Like you said, my message has been the same as, as Dave Ehrenberg, Georgia Kappelman, Sarah Dugan, Jack Campbell. Uh, John Singer, we all want Wendy to be charged, but you have to look at the evidence in an objective manner, not this hundred list you made in your base net, okay? And for him to make accusations against me, like I'm being paid, just goes to show you he's not objective, he's emotional. And it, it is insulting. And as a member of the bar, uh, an officer of the court, it's irresponsible. And um, I'm not representing anybody on the Adelson family. I will not represent anybody in the Adelson family. I went on court TV and said that she should be possibly charged with perjury. Now, how is that protecting Wendy? I went on the show today thinking there might be something in the phone that could be enough to have Georgia charge her. So it's just the message that they don't like. And it's not me because my message is the same as others. And I, and I don't know why, but I'm not in this to make money. I've lost money. You know, I did this show for you because I had five broken ribs and I was at home. I wasn't at the office. I tried to help. I tried to give this legal jargon simple so people can understand what's going on in the courtroom. And people want to know who my sources are. Well, let me tell you, I practiced in this town as a federal prosecutor, defense lawyer for 30 years. The, the first judge was my little brother in my fraternity. The state attorney, Jack Campbell, I was beating him when he was a younger misdemeanor prosecutor. I've tried cases with, with Georgia and Sarah. Law enforcement, Monica, I know all the sources in there. And I'll tell you what really, let me give you a story because someone says I'm a good storyteller. I went out of the house for the first time this weekend. My wife took me to Waffle House. And I didn't know, but then she talk, took me into home goods. So I know why she did that. I'm standing there looking at something and a woman approaches me and says, hey, Tim Jansen, how are you? I'm like, oh, hi, how are you? And I thought maybe she treated me at the hospital. She goes, I'm juror number seven in the Meg Bonawa trial. I watch your show. And she goes, can I have a picture with you? Can us jurors, we have a group chat. Will you meet with us and talk about the cases? I said, mm -hmm. sure. Now, 
That's what this community is. They know me. I represent a lot of people. So people think I got a mixed agenda. I'm trying to tell you based on my unique perspective. I'm not making any money. I'm not taking any cases. And I hope we can end this nonsense. And Tim, just one last question. Do you have any reason to not be objective in your commentary? I, I can't. That's all my, my integrity and my reputation is what I've done for the last 38 years as practicing law. As a former federal prosecutor, I never prosecuted anybody that I did not believe the evidence was sufficient to indict him. And, and Tim is a stand-up guy. And look, there is no room for pettiness. This is supposed to be about justice for Dan Markell. Um, and that's what our focus is going to be on. Just remember one thing. It's easy to sit and criticize. It's hard to do the hard work. And uh, I appreciate what Tim has done. And now that's in the rearview mirror. And we are moving uh, forward uh, from this very point on. Um, I am looking for something important here. Uh, the definition of perjury. That's what we are uh, switching over to. Yeah, we there it is. I just found it. Hit that comment down, COE, for me, please. Thank you. Perjury. It is the voluntary violation of an oath or vow, either by swearing to what is untrue or by omission to do what has been promised under oath, false swearing. Now, the only person besides me that's not an attorney on this panel, but she trumps us all because she's a PhD, is Karen Cyphers. Uh, Karen, I know you wanted a, you know, kind of... Um, elucidate that, make it clear that you're not an attorney, but you also had um, something you wanted to say about perjury. So the floor is yours. Well, first off, thank you so much, Joel, for having me on and nice to be uh, on the screen with the two of you. Um, I, I suppose I wanted to acknowledge right uh, out of the gate that I've spent a lot of time obviously listening to things that Wendy has said, both in her uh, interview with Craig Isom, the three trials, her podcast, um, and there's a lot of things in there that are on its face untrue. I want to acknowledge at the outset, though, that I understand that not everything that's untrue is perjury. Uh, things could be said that are emotional in nature that would be difficult to prove on a factual basis. Um, there could be some legitimate bad memory going on. Um, there could be things that are false without being intentionally so. Uh, there could be things that she says that are true, but are simply inconsistent with other things she said previously which is another definition of perjury. So I just wanted to acknowledge as the non-lawyer in here, I, I didn't want to make it seem like everything I challenge, do I believe would be perjury in a court. Um, but I think there really is like an enormous amount of things that Wendy has said that deserve some scrutiny, uh, whether it falls under that definition or not. Uh, John Singer, uh, perjury, um, you know, just tell us from a legal standpoint and you're, you know, you're, you've got a textbook mind. You're, you're a bit of a rain man in a good way. Uh, we are just talking off camera. This guy knows every statistic related to the new England Patriots. It's 1967, not 1963. You can't ask him about 64, five or six, but anything after 67. But, uh, do you remember your old textbooks about perjury, John? How serious a crime is it? Um, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, it's, it's very serious, and um, I've dealt with a lot of perjury cases over the course of my career. And I think, <clears throat> to pick up what, with what Karen said, from the very first trial, um, let's just leave aside for a second the five-hour and five-minute interrogation on July 18th that she had with the police. But just in all three trials, but even from the very first one, within five minutes, she was perjuring herself. I mean, she was lying through her teeth. We could recite um, a very lengthy list of things that she said on the witness stand that were just blatantly false. Are your parents millionaires? Does your brother drive a Ferrari? Were you happy that your motion was denied uh, to relocate? I mean, she lied repeatedly. Now, proving it is, is a different story. Um, we all know after hearing Wendy ad nauseum testify that she's a habitual recidivist liar, but to prove it is a different story. And it's not as easy as it may appear at first blush. Um, we know what she said under oath in the last trial, and we know what Jeff Lacasse said. And this, again, went to the celebration dinner, and it also went to the July 13th, uh, 2014 conversation about whether or not she admitted that Charlie had looked into hiring a hitman the prior summer. 
that is going to be a he said, she said analysis. So if they ever prosecuted Wendy for perjury as to uh, those comments that differ from uh, her recollection versus Jeff LaCasse's recollection, it's a he said, she said. It's not that easy to get a perjury conviction when it's it's those facts. It, it reminds me when I got out of law school, um, I was at a big firm in my first case, my first ever case involved a father and a daughter. It was an insider trading case. The father had bought two stocks immediately prior to acquisitions being effectuated. So when the acquiring company uh, was, was acquired, the stock obviously shot up and the father made a lot of money. And the first question they asked him under oath was, did your daughter work for either the investment bank that was the M&A banker on the deal or the law firm that did the M&A work? And he said, no. And it's just an objective fact that his daughter did work at the law firm. That's an easy perjury case. With Wendy, the jury's going to have, if they, if they did prosecute her for perjury, they're going to have to believe Jeff LaCasse. Now, he's far more believable than she is, but it's not a slam dunk in, in, in this type of perjury case. May I? Um, actually, this is a great, that's a great segue, if I may, uh, Joel, uh, respond to that a little bit. Please, please. Um, so I, I think uh, I think there's a little more to this uh, Jeff LaCasse uh, hitman disclosure than maybe apparent. Uh, there's a few different ways that his story has been corroborated already. Uh, this is something that actually the jury didn't hear in this last trial, but he did proffer to it with the jury out of the room, which is that before the murder, he actually shared with a friend of his that Wendy told him that her brother had looked into hiring a hitman the summer prior. So there is a witness out there who could potentially be called to corroborate that. Uh, he's had a therapist straight through all of this that he's also disclosed that to. He's talked about that very candidly. And then uh, not even to mention just how almost unheard of uh, Jeff's credibility has been when it comes to documenting the dates that certain things were said and then <clears throat> external evidence coming in and, and backing him up on it. There was a, uh, an inmate named Jason McNair who uh, gave a, an interview with law enforcement who shared that Sigfredo Garcia got drunk on toilet wine. He called it bump, which I think is kind of funny considering the role of a bump in this particular case. And McNair said that the prior, uh, he didn't actually give a time frame. He said prior to Sigfredo being hired, two other hitmen were hired by the Adelson family. They were paid $50,000 and they basically ran away with the money. Uh, if you think about this, there's no way Jeff LaCasse would have had any idea that this conversation had happened, um, nor would Jason, Jason McNair have known that Jeff LaCasse had heard anything from Wendy. But the story lines up completely, even down to the amount of money. Uh, so I think that's the kind of thing where it's not going to end up being just a he said, she said, or certainly wouldn't have to be um, on that. And I think that's just one, that's a it's a really big point in this case that has not been explored uh, a whole lot yet. Yeah. And just to pick up on on that, Karen, I think it's a very good point. Um, the, the, there's contemporaneous conversations because obviously one of the vulnerabilities that Jeff LaCasse had as a witness and, and one of the potential pitfalls for him was if this statement were truly made, what did he do about it? He, he testified that he didn't go to law enforcement. He testified that he was still willing to get back together with Wendy. Um, he testified that the reason he didn't go to law enforcement then was because it had happened a year ago and he no longer saw it as a ripe or present plot, at least to the best of his knowledge. But he did share in his testimony that he had gone to a friend to discuss it. And the friend was in accord with him that, that it seemed like it was a preterite act. It wasn't an ongoing conspiracy. So I think that helps. The fact that there was a contemporaneous discussion helps buttress Jeff LaCasse's version. But at the end of the day, there were only two people in that room. Now, again, I think that Jeff LaCasse is a lot more believable and you've got this uh, additional conversation. You've got the disclosures to the therapist. Um, but ultimately, there were two people in the room. So it, it, it is not going to be an easy road to hoe on the perjury. Um, and there's other examples, too. We, the, this is just one that we gave. There's many other examples of, of Wendy perjuring herself. Uh, speaking of examples, I want to get into stuff right away. We got a couple of video clips and uh, we have some uh, testimony that was given in the 2019, 2022 trial. And then the clips are from actually from court TV, uh, friends of ours from this uh, past trial. 
Uh, but let's just start with this. Um, hey, Joel, before you move forward. Yeah. So understand, this is a capital case. So if you mm -hmm. commit a perjury in a capital case, it's a second degree felony, punishable up to 15 years in jail. And if she's done this in multiple trials, you can stack them. And that would give the judge more time that he can, if they, at different times. So while I agree, perjury is not easy, but penalties can be extremely harsh in a capital case. And, and just to pick up on that, what Tim said, and, and the statute of limitations on with a perjury charge is, is not a lengthy one, except if the perjury is committed in a capital case. If it's in a capital case, I believe the statute of limitations is either elongated to 10 years or there is no statute of limitations. So whatever she said in 19, 22, 23, all can be prosecuted and stacked and they're not time barred. Hmm. Uh, great comments tonight. Um, here's the first uh, point, counterpoint. We'll go through these. We'll discuss them. First one has to do with Trescott Drive. You'll see here. Uh, there are inconsistent accounts of Wendy's drive to the crime scene roadblock. Wendy claims she didn't drive up Trescott to the crime scene. You fact check it. She did, in fact, do that. You heard the police officer who testified recognize her car. Karen Cyphers, this is a great point in case here. Sure. I mean, absolutely. She not only uh, did she say something that was untrue, but then. She also said things that are inconsistent. And my read of statute says that even if that there's no burden on the prosecution to determine which of the statements were actually true, if they are, in fact, inconsistent with one another. I think in this case, we actually do know what was true. She did drive up to the crime scene tape. The crime scene tape was tied to the post that was next to Danny's mailbox. Uh, she had to get extraordinarily close to the house to see that. And the scene she would have driven up to uh, she said, as a mom, I can't fathom driving up to that and not calling a check on, on my kids or my ex-husband. Mm. Um, by the way, very quickly, the COE is going to yell at me. Everyone's assuming I'm talking about one person and I'm not and I'm not trying to be veiled in what I'm saying. because It's not one person. And the actual one person that everyone seems to be talking about is a guy who I know is very emotional and I've met him and he's a good guy. And he's, I think, a good character. And um it's the last I'm going to save it is not not the only person. And I just think that if people are claiming to want justice for Dan Markell, that that should be the focus. It shouldn't be tearing down other people, whether there's emotion involved or not. And now we'll shut up. Tim Jansen. Well, I mean, if you uh, listen, I mean, I, I do want to address. I mean, Tim pointed out who this person was by referring to the list of 100 examples, which or the 100 indicators, which, by the way, a lot of Carl's points are things that we're going to be talking about today. And I think we're all going to be in agreement about. In fact, I think Tim was even in agreement about many of those points on this very show. Um, certainly, yes. there is a lot of emotion here. And I do think that Carl has done a phenomenal job of verbalizing a lot of things and organizing a lot of things that we uh, can get value out of. Yeah, and I, I, you know, beyond, but I think that, I don't think it's a bad idea to to have transparency about what people's motivations are. And so this is a great conversation to have, but I, I certainly wouldn't blame anyone for asking questions when there's been inconsistent uh, narratives and some yeah. of them fairly frankly confusing. And so I don't, I'm not going to go down the path if you guys don't want to, but I, I would hate for Carl to get singled out when in fact he's, he's just been the only one maybe brave enough to put his face behind it. Yeah, Carl's definitely not being singled out. And I'll say I like Carl and I like John a lot and I've met them both and they're both going to be, um, you know, back on the show. Um, and I have no animus towards well, him. I never said I, I, I didn't. Dis I, I just disagreed. The only thing I disagreed with Carl was that they didn't have enough to charge Wendy. And then he assumed that I was on the take or I was trying to get hired by Wendy. He made a lot of great points. John, Carl and I did a lot of shows where we went through all the lists, some of them we all agree, most of them we all agreed to. Mm -hmm. Carl's done great work. But when I didn't agree that there was enough to charge Wendy, then he personally attacked me. And other people are jumping on now. And I wasn't going to respond. I, I didn't, I never responded. I was only responding to Joel's comments. Yeah, and by the way, I was raised by my mother and my father. Uh, I always confront situations. I'm going to talk to Carl. It's not that I'm, I'm actually finishing the final edits on my book, and I've been mired in that. But I will call Carl probably after the show. Again, 
I have nothing against Carl. I think he's a very, very bright guy, very capable. Um, he's a prosecutor. Tim's a criminal defense attorney. And they each come at it from a different side. My issue is when the emotion overtakes people and there's name calling. And that wasn't even really Carl. It was a lot of people outside of Carl. And uh, they know who I'm talking about. Um, and Carl and I will talk and I'll talk with John Steinbeck. And there is, like I said, there is no animus. The COE is having a nervous breakdown behind the scenes, but we're grown ups and we can talk about this and look, debate is what it's all about. And that's why we're here to talk about it. So, uh, you know, feel free to send in your comments, uh, whether you agree or you disagree, but you know, I, I didn't want to out Carl and I'm not outing Carl, but Karen brought him, brought him up and I'm glad she did. Carl is a good guy. He's a very smart guy, a very capable, capable, capable guy. And he's really growing his channel and, and we're rooting for him. Uh, Steve Cohen is rooting for him. Uh, we've helped Carl get on the court TV and we're going to continue to help each other. So I mean, just listen, so you if all we're talking, know, but... if we're talking sports stats, I mean, he was batting a thousand from a thousand miles away on everything he predicted that would happen in this past trial, which I think, I, I, I honestly think that that's pretty impressive. And so I, I, I am a fan of, of all of everything that's going on here. And I think the debate is worthwhile. I agree a hundred percent. So let's move it on here. Look at this, the COE. I knew she popped in. Let's focus on the story. I think we owe it to the Markells to focus on the story. You got to have a wife to keep you uh, steady, rock steady, as they say. Let's move on to another one here, uh, John Singer, uh, and that would be life insurance. Wendy denied making inquiries to take over as the custodian of the life insurance money. Fact check, she did. Um, how big a deal is this? I mean, I think it's 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 all part of the puzzle. In other words, if they're going to get, if they're ever going to prosecute Wendy for perjury, they're they're not going to have to rely on, you know, one um, statement that she made that's in conflict with what Jeff Lacas said, or one thing she said that's in conflict with what the police officer said about seeing her at the crime scene. There's going to be there's so so many things that Wendy said on the witness stand that were patently untrue. And if that's the way the prosecution wants to go, then that's the way they're gonna go and they're gonna have a treasure trove of information from which to choose. I hope that's not the way they go. I think we all hope the same thing we've hoped since day one, which is they want to um, indict her for being a co-conspirator. If Georgia Kaplman had her druthers, she would she would indict her. And that that's where I, I, I veer towards the Carl, uh, the, the Tim, camp, which is nobody wants to indict her more than Georgia Kaplman. If you listen to the back and forth between the two of them and look at the evolution of it from trial one to trial two to trial three, Georgia hates her guts. Okay. She hates this woman with all of her fibers <laughs> and it's true. And she can only, did you hear the comments that Georgia made? after Wendy would give these cuckamamie answers. They had to be stricken from the record. Rashbaum was right. He moved to strike every one of them because I'll give you an example. There was one time where Wendy wouldn't give in um, on saying something to Isom during the police interrogation. And Wendy chimed in, well, I'm not sure the transcript was accurate. And you know what Georgia said? Oh boy. And that of course is stricken because you can't do that. That's just a ad hominem comment you're allowed to make. Georgia did three of those. Wendy said, this is the first time I learned about it. Um, the theory that it was extortion. You know what Georgia said? Yeah, me too. Like, like she hates her. So, <laughs> it, and, and, I, and I do think, by the way, and, and I, I do think there are some overt acts that Wendy engaged in that could be used to indict her with. I, I don't mm -hmm. think it's overwhelming like it is with Donna. We've talked about this ad nauseum. But there are some overt acts you can point to um, to get her with. But again, th their, their goal isn't perjury. Their goal is to charge her as a co-conspirator. And I mean, that's, she's the white whale to them. I mean, make no mistake about it. John Singer, uh, on, just staying on topic with your New England Patriots trivia, and I know I bust your you-know-what, but do you have a photographic memory in the sense when you're preparing for a case, can you remember things from certain pages that you just bring up in the middle of a trial? I, I give most of my opening and closings, which tend to be three to four hours. And I guess in civil <laughs> cases, they're a lot longer than criminal. I use no notes. Um, it's all in my head. I don't write anything down. 
I'm not very smart, but I have a very good memory. And memory compensates for lack of intellect any day of the week. So I, I remember, listen, I've watched all three trials. I've listened to her five hours and five minutes. I remember a lot of what she said. And I remember a lot of what Georgia said. So, um, and, and it just, this was high theater too. You know, the, the Georgia Wendy back and forth and colloquy was high theater. And if you look at it, Georgia got progressively more frustrated with Wendy. People thought she got frustrated with Charlie. I think she was amused by Charlie and was just waiting to, to, to for summation because she knew she wasn't going to get anything out of him. She was generally frustrated by Wendy. Uh, Singer, do you think you could still go without notes for three hours if me and three of my friends came bare chested with your name written across our chest, screaming your name during, uh, during your opening statements? Yeah, I'm in a zone. Like Tim can tell you when you're mm. on one trial, you're in a zone. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't even be on my radio. You could yell whatever you want about the Patriots, my kids, my wife. I don't know if she's hearing this. Um, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even hear you. I'm going to take you up on that. So here's an interesting comment, and uh, Tim brought this up, so I'm going to go to him on it. Um, from Don Hagerman, who's a friend of the show. Who knows what's on Donna's phone? Stay tuned. Should be interesting. A trial plus the jailhouse calls. Tim Jansen, you said it today. So Donna's phone was seized. Um, by Pat Sanford, the FBI agent that arrested her, who testified in Charlie's trial. How big a deal could that be moving forward in a case against Wendy? Uh, well, she's proven not to be able to make good decisions and cover her trails. I doubt she's really tech savvy like young people are. And even if you think you've erased something or deleted it, FBI can find it. And the fact that her lawyer told her never to let the FBI or law enforcement get your phone. Um, and she probably didn't think they were going to get her phone, right? She's just going a one-way ticket, um, and she's going, and she was calling that neighbor, so she had that conversation. Who else? Who else was she texting? Um, what was she looking? Was she looking up on her computer? Um, it could be a treasure trove that could be enough that Georgia says, okay, we've got these emails and texts. This will clearly is different than what Wendy testified. It clearly gives us knowledge. Um, so we can put that piece of the puzzle together with what she did. And that could be enough that the, the state feels comfortable going forward. Their reluctance That's is you only get one shot. You know, double jeopardy precludes prosecuting someone twice. Um, so that they're not going to they're not going to risk it. So we all think she's involved. We all want her to be charged, but we don't want her to lose. We don't want Georgia to lose. Right. <laughs> Uh, Christina, the COE keeps the channel running. She keeps the house running. She keeps my kids running. Space Coast in Los Angeles keeps all the tech stuff going. Steve Cohen keeps getting us the best guests in true crime. And the mods are the best mods that there are uh, in all the business, not just true crime. Uh, Karen Cyphers, since you're not the lawyer and this is a legal question, I'm going to go to you. Uh, Maui <laughs> Swift. <laughs> does, Wendy, does Wendy's perjury annul her immunity she received? in the last three trials? How would you answer it? And then we'll get John Singer's take. Okay, so my understanding, the reason why a government would give immunity to a witness is to compel honest testimony. Uh, they are not gonna immunize perjury itself. And in fact, I've heard, and I don't, the, the lawyers here can tell me if this is true, that especially the extent of perjury could undermine immunity on other statements as well. And so I certainly don't think uh, the bare minimum immunity that she has is going to be an issue whatsoever. She didn't say anything incriminating. Um, and, and I guess like the, my question would be, you know, I know, uh, Tim, you, you've referenced that she was consulting an immunity expert. And mm -hmm. I guess my question, not to get back to politics, but I would wonder whoever sourced that, whoever leaked that, whoever said it, why would they? I mean, doesn't that seem like uh, uncommon for a, a a lawyer to disclose who he's talking to. And if it did come from her team, could that have been intended to dampen the ability for other witnesses to want to come forward or anything like that? that that's the same nonsense. That never came How? from her team. It never came from her team. Then so a lawyer had a consult with her and broke privilege? I guess that's the question. No. Is it somebody okay. it just it just it's just nonsense, okay? And I'm not getting any attorney client information from her team. 
I haven't spoken to her team. And I mean, that how long? I mean, you've talked about me from somewhere else. Okay. And I'm not going to disclose I, I, my source. I don't but, want you to disclose your source, but I think you should. Un I think I think what the world is trying to understand is that you do have sources. You've talked openly about having open communication with Charlie's defense team and John Loro. You're the one who's coming forward with information about Wendy getting Castigar experts to give her advice. My I understanding is lawyers thing. generally don't don't talk about who they're talking to. That that's that's not true. And uh -huh. first of all, I came on the show and mentioned that I had met with John uh, Rashbaugh. He came and talked to me. I didn't seek him out. He came and talked to me, and he did that because he wanted to find out about the community of Tallahassee. He wanted to find out about Georgia, wanted to find out about the judge, how the judge was. That's what it was, fishing. And I disclosed that publicly to everybody here. I disclosed that I ran into Wendy one day in a parking lot for five minutes. I disclosed that, right? I wasn't hiding that. I have no, no, nothing in this thing. Um, right. I mean, people think that I'm somehow involved trying to protect Wendy. Far be it. I think she sure. should. And and I don't, I don't attribute motive on your part. What I'm really saying, what I was trying to, what I was trying to ask, really, is that I'm not questioning your motives in this. I'm questioning the motives of whoever leaked that information because I think there are consequences for for putting that out there. It could discourage witnesses from coming forward. And on that note, for everyone listening, if you're listening to Wendy's testimonies from the past three years, and you're one of the people who has thought, ah, oh, they're never going to get her. I'm not going to put myself into this mess. I'd come forward, talk to somebody, tell them what you've heard her say that isn't true. But I think hearing that she's talking to immunity experts and, you know, that does discourage that type of participation in the system. And so I think that's where, I think that's where some of that skepticism came from, Tim. Well, the problem is, is that some people don't understand the immunity, okay? They don't understand derivative use immunity. And most lawyers don't understand it. It's a problem for the state, okay? And someone's tried to compare my Brian Winchester case with derivative use immunity. My client didn't enter a plea, okay? I negotiated a proffer session where I threw in derivative use immunity. And when my client told him where the body was, they could never prosecute him. So I'm very familiar with derivative use immunity and how it, it's a limitation on the state to be able to prosecute. It's not easy. It's not impossible. Georgia can do it. But she's given three times immunity to her, three times. So she's going to have to get over that hurdle. She probably could, but it's going to be a problem. They're going to have to have hearings on it. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you, based on my experience, doing this for 37 years, 37 years as a federal prosecutor and as a defense lawyer. That's I just would I'm love saying. an example of anything Wendy has said that would qualify her for immunity for that statement. Everything she says is immunized. Everything she says, they cannot use derivative use. They can't use it to go look up leads. They but can't she hasn't said anything that would send somebody on a lead. That's what I'm saying is I can't think of anything she said in any of the trials beyond per beyond lying. For example, she lied about driving up to the crime scene tape. That she said she did not do that. That would not qualify for immunity because that is untrue. Well, you can argue she said she didn't pull all the way up. I didn't pull onto the street. I pulled close to it and I saw the barricade. I didn't <clears throat> see an officer. I mean, that's it was not a mile and a half away. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think part of the issue here is, uh, you know, is the lens we're looking at this through. And Tim is coming from it uh, from, as a defense attorney in Tallahassee. John Singer, do you have anything to add to what uh, is transpiring between Karen and Tim here? I have, I have two things to add just from a macro standpoint, then getting into Castigar. One is <clears throat> it's interesting because I, I think that with the exception of um, the people who knew Dan, um, you know, and who were friends with Dan, those of us who, who didn't know Dan um, and aren't from the community, what what the centripetal force was for, for, I think, most of us, if not all of us, was the anger and the frustration that the Adelsons had not been charged when it was so patently obvious to anyone who even learned of the modicum of evidence out there just from any of the over my, just from over my dead body, that podcast alone, that the Adelsons were guilty. And that's what drove all of us, I think, to this obsession, this case. Now that the Adelsons, at least two of them, have been arrested and one has been convicted, 
it's just it's ironic and also troubling to me that there's now vitriol within the community of people who all are in accord as to what they want. All of a sudden, after nine years, Don Adelson gets charged when she should have been charged in 2016 after the bump. There was enough evidence then to get her. We all knew that. All of a sudden she's charged and now we see this exacerbation of tension between people who are really on the same page. We People may have differing views on whether the evidence is strong enough to sustain an indictment, but we all want the same thing and we should be, there shouldn't be rancor here. Mm-hmm. On, on Castigar, my, my view as to Wendy, what, what is the overt act that I think they have against Wendy? I think that Wendy was the source of the information um, for when the hit had to take place. So we knew from Rivera and we knew from other witnesses that the, the hit had to take place on July 18th because Dan Markell was going out of town the next day to New York uh, to see his girlfriend. How would the hitman have known that, right? That had to have come from Wendy. Now, I guess one could argue that it could have come from maybe Wendy told Donna and Donna told Charlie, Charlie told Katie. But Wendy had asked, you know, uh, we saw that text about if Danny was going to be around that week, if she could have the kids one night. It's like it's more likely than not that she was the source of the information um, as to where Danny was going that morning, that he went to the gym first and that it had to be done that day because he was leaving the following day. The derivative, the use and derivative use immunity does not preclude the state from going after Wendy for that because they already had independent evidence of that. They already had it from Rivera. They already had the text messages from Wendy to Dan. Nothing Wendy said on the witness stand is something that had that that was a derivative source of the information. Now, what Tim was saying was because she got immunity three times, and by the way, she had to get an immunity three times. They needed Wendy on the witness stand to prove motive. Without getting that divorce filing in, without getting those vitriolic emails from Donna Adelson in, the the case would have been incomplete. So they needed Wendy. The fact that she got the immunity means there's there's an impediment and there's a hurdle and there's some hoops you have to jump through. But there's definitely independent evidence that exists to get around Castigar to prosecute Wendy if you think that that overt act I referenced is something you could get her on. Now, again, I can see what the rebuttal is to that, that other people could have provided the hitmen with that information. But uh, so that, that's all I wanted to say on Castigar. I have a, I have a question for you, uh, um, John. So one of the things that I noticed that she lied about actually is about her immunity. So uh, she claimed that she would have testified with or without immunity, that she did not require that as a condition for getting up there. We know she she fought super hard not to do the defense deposition. She tried to, tried to quash that. Uh, there's no, every time she appears, her lawyer appears beforehand and says, she's doing this because there's this immunity. She would not appear on the defense. So for her to say that, which is, seems to be a lie, she's lying about immunity. Does she have immunity for lying about that? I, okay. So I'm going to now contradict my own, um, photographic memory that I think stole to Joel. A few ago. <laughs> I do not remember her saying, I remember her feigning understanding of the immunity she was given, the scope and breath. I remember her saying that her parents would have voluntarily testified. I do not remember her saying that she would have voluntarily testified without immunity. You may be. She said it was in it was in 2022 um, and she was asked uh, she was asked to describe her immunity deal and uh, the defense asked her and you needed that to testify, right? And she said, it's just given to testify. It's not a question of whether I needed it. It comes with testifying. Um, and then they said, you fear being charged by them. So you need to have that protection of your words. And so she said, I don't fear being charged for a crime. Da, da, da. Essentially, she said, um, no, I, I did not need immunity to be here. Um, I, I, I don't I, fear I, being charged. So I did not. Yeah. So that, that's where that comes from. I don't agree with that. I agree with your recitation of what happened now. I'm remembering Chris to coast on cross exactly the way you portrayed it. And she said, it didn't, I, <laughs> never, I wasn't never, afraid. I would have come. All right. Completely lost my train of thought with that Patriots, that, that gratuitous comment. <laughs> when I remember Chris Coast asked her the question, I remember saying, it just comes with, it. I remember the exact um, tone of her voice, but she didn't say she would have done it 
without the immunity. She said, she said, she didn't say she would have testified without the immunity. She just simply said it comes with it, not that she needed it. But I think what you're, she never made the comment that she would have testified had she not gotten immunity. Mm. She only testified that it came she with it. She heard it. She said, so she, she answered in the negative, but she didn't say the word no. So he said, and you needed that to testify, right? And she said, it's not a question of whether I needed it. It comes with testifying. That's um, not but even we know. Close to perjury. That's not close to getting her for perjury. For that. that's, there's, there's, no. that's not even the top 25 things that she perjured herself no. about. I mean, there's a, as we said, there's a laundry list. The, five minutes into the first, in, in the 2019 trial, your parents millionaires. No. Did your brother drive a Ferrari? They probably have a picture of her in the Ferrari. They could get her on that. They probably have a picture. Charlie probably, there's probably a social media picture of the two of them sitting in a front. That's something that's objectively easy to prove or disprove. Whether the immunity thing, it's so muddy. Like she, I know what I know what she meant and I know you know what she meant, but that's not enough to get her on perjury for that. Uh, Karen from Milana, uh, both John and Carl have actually addressed this. I'm curious to get your take. My guess is Georgia Kaplman should have much more evidence that was elicited from Wendy in the trial so far, question mark. Do you think Georgia has cards, you know, held to her vest that we just don't know about? Because we don't know what we don't know. I don't know. I know that Jack Campbell in the press conference last week said that there's evidence that people haven't seen. So we can rely on that, I think. Let's go to a, a video clip here. Um this is from Court TV. It's Wendy on the stand in the most recent trial, and then we will break it down. Healthy debate. It's what made America democracy a function, a sort of functioning democracy. Here we go. Murder, do you recall going to a dinner where you got sick at the table? It was about a month later. And yes, I remember. Where did that dinner occur? Was that here in Tallahassee or somewhere else? No, it was in Miami. All right. And was it like a, out at a restaurant? It was at a restaurant. All right. And when we say you got sick at the table, did you actually vomit at the table? I threw up at the table. All right. And did you ever hear your brother refer to that particular dinner as a celebratory dinner? No. Did you tell Jeffrey Lacoste that your brother called that a celebratory dinner? I did not. Did you was that a one moment, Ms. Kaplan? Yes, sir. Objection. Was that dinner a celebration of the murder of your ex husband? Absolutely not. That dinner was the first time I left my house after over a month because I was terrified. And if it was a celebration of anything, it was a celebration that I was willing to leave the house and eat a meal. Oh. I don't know if that continued on there, actually. Uh, we'll go back to, I don't know if we have Jeff Lacoste, uh, COE. Just let me know if we have Jeff Lacoste there. But um, Karen, what did you think of that exchange uh, talking about the uh, dinner, the celebration dinner? Uh, two things. First off, it couldn't have been a month after he was murdered on July 18th. They get to Miami July 19th or 20th. And the celebration dinner was July 31st. So first off, it certainly wasn't a month. Um I mean, I think the fact that uh, LaCasse talks about this and it was independently corroborated from text messages by uh, Officer Hale, um, I think, again, speaks to the fact that Jeff kept good notes and has a great memory and was piece piecing a lot together. I also think this is a phenomenal opportunity for the people she might have already been dating and hanging out with in Miami uh, in the call it a month if you want to, but in the two weeks after the murder for them to come forward and say, oh, no, she was out with us the night prior to that. Uh, she was not holed up in her house. Uh, afraid of her shadow. So I think there's an opportunity there. Uh, I want to, I'm going to bring that back up just to see if we have Jeff Lacasse. Someone corrected me on the pronunciation of his name and I attribute it to my Jersey accent. Let's see if there's more here. Hang on. During one of those phone calls, did you learn about a dinner where Wendy had become ill at the table? Yes, I did learn about that. And what did you learn about that dinner? Um, that she went out to dinner with Charlie for what he called a celebration dinner. He said something to her. She spontaneously vomited on the table. And this would have been within how much time after the homicide? Within a few weeks. Was it specified that the celebration was in reference to Dan Markell's death as opposed to 
Anything else? Wasn't specified. Okay. But whatever it was, that's the dinner where she vomited. That's right. Uh, obvious uh, courtesy goes to Court TV. Um, John Singer, what did you make of that entire exchange? Wendy saying one thing, Jeff LaCasse saying another thing. I mean, it, it's it's another direct contradiction. And I think as Karen, you know, astutely pointed out that not only did she have the date wrong, but um, uh, there, there may be other evidence of that or maybe contemporaneous commentary about that, which would help buttress uh, Jeff's version. Um, also, you know, if they ever did charge her with perjury and that were one of the counts, you could obviously look at her. Um, you could you could see if she had left the house over the prior 13 days and what she did, who she spent time with, what her texts show. Um, you know, it, it's she she it, it Jeff Lacasse has no reason to contrive that sort of a story. I, I know that the defense tried to paint him as you know, a jilted um, ex-boyfriend and had a lot of anger towards Wendy and animus for the way things ended. But at the end of the day, for him, who just, he, he seems so credible and he's been so consistent, both in the three police interviews and in the three rounds of testimony he's given, it, it, it would seem to me illogical that he would, he would make something like that up. Um, so I think, I think you have, I think the, the, the logic tells you that the person lying is Wendy. And, and the only other thing to add is just, it, it so encapsulates Wendy as a witness where she just can't agree with the agreeable. George is like, did you throw up? Or did you vomit? No, I threw up. It's the same damn thing. Just say it, Wendy. Like, stop <laughs> quarreling with every single thing. It makes you look so slippery and so duplicitous. It's the same thing, you know? Like, just give in when you when you... That's what we tell witnesses all the time on cross. Don't fight everything. Give in when there's a point you need to give in on. Just that's that's an aside. Well, it would have been so much if she had just said, yeah, the divorce was awful. It was bitter. It was contentious. I was mad. Like, but for her to, you know, she it was like pulling teeth to get her to acknowledge that it was even unpleasant. Well, and, and just apropos of that, you know, Karen and, and, and Joel and Tim, the another thing that Georgia said that, that got her in a little hot water with Rashbaum um, was when Wendy said that they were in a really good place at the time of the murder. And henceforth, the Adelson family uh, didn't have any reason at that point to be mad at Dan anymore. And then Georgia, you know, retorts with um, getting along fine, just fine. Like, it wasn't a question. It was just she couldn't help herself because the lies were so, it's so anathema to any of us who are, you know, who are truthful people or in the case of Tim and I, members of the bar, when you hear a witness lie through their teeth, it's frustrating. It's really hard to contain yourself and move on with the next question. So you say things like, and Georgia did it three or four times and she's a professional, but like any of us, she couldn't help herself because the lies were so brazen. Yeah. Um, Tim, when you look at this video that we just played, um, and I'm going to I'm going to roll it back for just a second, because I just want to get your take as a trial attorney about. Do I mean, you, you recall just, just, going to, to a listen. dinner where but you just got at sick at the table? Here, let's listen for one second. It was about a month later. And yes, I remember. Where did that dinner occur? Was that here in Tallahassee or somewhere else? No, it was in Miami. All right. And was it like a, out at a restaurant? It was at a restaurant. All right. And when we say you got sick at the table, did you actually vomit at the table? I threw up at the table. All right. And did you ever hear your brother refer to that particular dinner as a celebratory dinner? No. Did you tell Jeffrey Lacoste that your brother called that a celebratory dinner? I did not. Did was that a... One moment, Ms. Cowell. Yes, sir. Hearsay. Overruled. Was that dinner a celebration of the murder of your ex-husband? Absolutely not. That dinner was the first time I left my house after over a month because I was terrified. And if it was a celebration of anything, it was a celebration that I was willing to leave the house and eat a meal. Now, Tim Jansen, she looked like me at the beginning of the show, frustrated, stressed out, you know, her neck is getting red there. Um, how much of that plays to the jurors in terms of sort of an inherent bias when they're when they're watching her they can tell 
She's very uncomfortable. Well, she's closing her eyes. She's already got an answer before the question's done. She's been prepped pretty well. No one's going to believe that she was celebrating her night out. Um, she couldn't remember the date. Uh, she was already in denial before Georgia finished the question. Clearly, she, she was prepped. She knew it was coming. Um, this is probably the second or third time she's already testified uh, under questioning from Georgia. She clearly is not a, a person telling the truth. Um, she has a motive to lie. Uh, the immunity is, does not protect her from perjury. That's clear. Uh, there's no double, the double jeopardy doesn't come into place for a perjury charge. Um, it'd be interesting. I don't know how they're going to do it, what they're going to do. Jack did say they have more evidence, but he said that in the context of the um, press conference about Donna. So I don't know if it was in relation to Donna or maybe to other people, but they, he did mention that Harvey was let go. They didn't have enough evidence or to arrest Harvey at the scene. So we don't really know what they have. They've gone methodically prosecuting these people from the very beginning, from the shooters to the middle person, to the person that hired them, now to Donna. Now, the next step, obviously, is why haven't they prosecuted Wendy? Um, they did need her for motive, and they need, they did need to bring her in also for impeachment for the conversation about hiring the hitman because it would have been a hearsay statement to Lacoste that was, and it was a motion in limine was granted. So, but when she got up there and denied it, you were allowed to impeach somebody. They brought her back. They drove her back from Madison, wherever she was. And she had to admit. And then once she denied it, then they let Lacoste testify that he had made the statement about how, and that was a big piece of evidence in the case because you want to plant that seed to the jury that this guy joked about hiring a hitman who killed his brother-in-law. And he died by death of a hitman. It made the whole extortion theory nonsense. Fascinating Scott thing here. is that last uh, last trial, she didn't even concede the fact that a hitman had killed him. It's true. She was asked that. He said, "She said, no, I don't know that to be true." Yeah. Um. You know, Karen, we all talked a little bit off uh, camera. There's also um, some talk about trying to hire a hitman prior to that, Karen. Um which I'm a little hazy about. Um, are, are you able to fill us in on the on the details? I think we have some tape of that too. If that's something you want us to sure. play. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to. I mean, there was a, a, a prior news reporter on this. It was a while back. There was a inmate who, <clears> I, you know, spent time with Sigfredo uh, and said that Sigfredo opened up while he was drunk one night and said that uh, they were hired to commit this. Uh, this murder only after a different set of hitmen had taken $50,000 from the Adelson family and not done the job. And, uh, you know, taken on its own, who knows, but taken alongside what Lacasse uh, heard from Wendy directly. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty strong. Let's listen to this actually and get uh, John and Tim's take after listening. This is someone uh, who was in the jail and uh, this is them relaying the information from Sigfredo Garcia. Let's take a listen together. December 20, 2016, I'm Investigator Isom. I'm at the Leon County Jail in the presence of Jason Lee McNair. He has information regarding Defendant Sigfredo Garcia. We was in a room together, all of me, me, him, and two other dudes, and it was a cellmate, and we was in a room together, he had been drinking a little... A little buck, which is called liquor, you know what I'm saying? He, he burst out with it. When they, when they first took play that, she, the woman done had hired two other people for $50,000, but it never did go down. So that when his baby mama said that she had somebody that would do it, and she would make sure that everything take go down, and the money that would be provided for Garcia done to split. But did this same woman, this Don woman, did she pay fifty thousand dollars to two other guys? Yes, sir. To, 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 to two other dudes, but other dudes never did go through with the first with, with, with the lick, though. Okay. And what were they supposed to do, the two first guys? Come up, come up, come up here, tell us, and and how they been what they put have for the money, but they never did make rain, but to come up in and do it. They got the money and, and kept going with it. Handle business, meaning what? Handle business, mean come up here and kill the dude. I mean, taking care of what they put to take care of as a street turn. 
John Singer. So this is uh, basically an informant uh, talking about what Sigfredo Garcia told him that uh, Donna, a woman named Donna, was going to pay 50000 or did pay $50,000 to a couple of hitmen who didn't carry out the job. Like Karen just said, when you couple that with what Jeff Lacasse had to say on the stand, uh, what do you make of this? I mean, I think it's, look, there, there's always going to be skepticism um, from where the source, you know, who the source is in this case. We don't know what the motive was. We, we don't know if the person was trying to curry favor to get a better deal. I don't know what the person's prison sentence was. I don't know when when was the um, when was that interview? I didn't see on the on the on the clip there. Do you know when the interview was? Uh, I don't. Karen, do you know? No, I'd have to look. At it. I mean, I'm just wondering if it was after the story had already gone public, because I doubt. I think it was prior to that. I'll, I'll find out in just a second. I'll it, let you know. It's, I mean, the question then is, is this inmate alive and why didn't they put him on the witness stand? They must have thought, they must have had serious doubts if the person is alive about his credibility or what that would look like in front of the jury. Because um, if there were not a motive and uh, that would be strong and powerful testimony. Um, the fact they didn't put him on suggests to me that assuming he's alive, that there were other factors in play and that they were, they, they somehow established this person had either an ax to grind or was looking at curry favor. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, Tim, what do you make of that? Well, it all depends when he says this conversation took place, where it took place. Isom's a pretty good detective. He was there for a long, long time. And I've worked with him many times. He will follow a lead anywhere it goes. We don't know if maybe he said this conversation took place and they double checked and found out that that inmate could not have been there. It could have been just gossip or maybe his baggage was so bad that they decided not to use it because sometimes you, you put a witness on the stand has got so much baggage, you lose the message, right? And you end up eating this baggage and you don't get the message out and the jury doesn't believe it and you can lose credibility. Mm -hmm. Um, John Singer, a lot of people were asking because you uh, you texted me and I mentioned it in the show that today, John, what did you mean when you said Donna will not make it to trial? You know, I, I don't know if she's going to survive um, the next year, year and a half is going to take to get to a trial. And, and I don't necessarily mean she's going to die of natural causes. And I would never from a mental health standpoint, I'm, I'm not in her head and I wouldn't want to predict that she's going to and you know, commit suicide, but just, just think for a second about where her head must be at right now. Charlie was as cocky and as arrogant and as narcissistic as you get. And I think he thought, and I think the whole family thought that there was a chance of acquittal, that he was gonna get up there and he was gonna delude a jury into believing that theory about the double extortion. He was 47 when he went on trial. He had a very, very good attorney he was, he had all of his faculties. He was strong on the witness stand. He had a great command of everything. Now let's contrast that to Donna. Her son is in jail for the rest of his life. That theory fell flat. They convicted him in three hours, including lunch. She's <laughs> frail. She has nothing to go on. She has no defense. She has no prayer of ever seeing the light of day. She's never gonna see her grandchildren again. She's never going to see her daughter again as a free woman. She's never going to see her husband again as a free woman. So what does she have to live for at this point? Why would now, again, I'm not uh, predicting that she's going to kill herself. I, I, I'm not qualified to do that. And I, I wouldn't go out on that strong of a limb, but would it be beyond the, Charlie in a million years, I never thought, was um, going to do that, and I thought he would be going to trial and testifying, and we all thought that would that would come to fruition, and it did. Is Donna going to make it the next for the next year and a half? Does she have anything to live for? Does she have any prayer of getting a acquittal? And the answer, I think, is no, no, and no. So um, when I say that she may not make it to trial, it's not because I think that the charters are going to get dropped. No, not quite the opposite. It just said, I don't know if she's going to survive this. Yeah, it's a, it's a heavy burden to bear. Um, 
Karen, to you here, I don't have this clip, but I think Wendy's fear. Oh, this is not the uh, comment. This I'm going to come to that comment in a second. But I, uh, from Alana, I think Wendy's fear was maybe more about the realization that it was her circus and her monkeys and she knew it was going to uh, not going to go well for her. But this is what I was coming to. Uh, I don't have this clip. Uh, what are your thoughts, Karen, about what sounded like Wendy almost saying hitman during the latest testimony? There was some buzz about that. Did you uh, find that to be a, some sort of Freudian slip? Uh, anything more than than that? It's interesting. I mean, I really enjoy hearing folks with these different backgrounds uh, bring what they what you know their expertise to the case and watching body language folks analyze stuff. It's pretty inspiring. Um, I don't I don't really know. I mean, I think I think there is an impulsivity about Wendy that comes out sometimes. I think some of what she was doing uh, with Detective Isom was premeditated as a way to give herself some alibis. Honestly, um, to you know really give some reverse psychology, throw people off, send them down the wrong trail. But I think some of it might have also been impulsivity where uh, she didn't necessarily plan ahead to say everything she said and probably regretted it later. Um, mm -hmm. Just to answer a question, because I did find my notes on McNair, that was December of 2016. So that was only a month and a half or so after, uh, after uh, Katie's arrest. It was pretty early. Um, there was no conversation, at least in the interview, that I heard the full clip about uh, reduction of any sentence or anything like that for McNair. And my my notes, uh, and this is something that I think the lawyers here could give us a little more uh, insight on, was that they couldn't put him on the stand due to something about hearsay and the conspiracy charge. So um, I don't I don't really fully understand that, but I know that there was some attempt, I think, to, there, to there, use there, the testimony. There wouldn't be a hearsay issue because it's an admission okay. of a opponent in the Garcia case. So it's not hearsay. It's not, it's, it's an, it's not a hearsay exception. It's non hearsay um, because it's an admission by a party okay. opponent. Mm -hmm. But um, by December of 16, the story was already in the public domain. Um, it was already out there. The tapes were already out there um, uh, from the bump. So I'm not sure how that person got Donna's information, but, but again, we don't know what, uh, I don't know sitting here today, well, I'll from Sigfredo is what he says, right? Pardon? Well, he, what he says is he got that directly from Sigfredo. No, 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 I, I understand that. But I'm saying I'm saying that at that point, the name was out there. Donna's name was already out there. So, by the way, and Sigfredo might have gotten it at that point. We don't know what Sigfredo knew contemporaneously, given the, as Georgia said, these, these were like train cars where they were walled off one from the other. So who knew? Who I, We don't know if Sigfredo ultimately knew Donna's name then. Uh, Amanda the Yahoo I'm not going to bring this comment up because I want to get to this other comment but she says I need a dictionary when John Singer is on um, my father small um, diversion here used to make me sit and read with him I think I've mentioned this on the show when I was in like 7th and 8th grade and uh, my friends would come over and he'd make me read um, Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne with, with me because he wanted me to be cultured and understand literature and I don't have the patience for that. So I'm going to send my kids to John Singer's home for the summer instead. And they will do fine on their verbal SATs. How's your math, John? Is it as strong as your verbal uh, no. stuff? Uh, no. Okay. Weak. Very weak. John Singer, how do, you, how do you think Rashbaum did? I want you to get yelled at too. So I'm going to ask this question <laughs> to you. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to caveat this by saying I was yeah. not in the room. So I, I, I can't see the synergies between or the lack thereof between Rashbaum and the jurors. Joel, I know you were in the courtroom, Karen. I don't know if you were, but I, I, I couldn't observe that dynamic. But from a professional standpoint, I, and I think I said this last time, it was quite impressive um, that there was no division of labor amongst the defense team. Um, the uh, Miss Myers only did one witness, which was that abhorrent uh, matrimonial lawyer for Wendy. Every other witness was done by uh, Rashbaum, the opening and closing, fact witnesses, police experts, what what have you. So I thought that was a a, 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 a he took a laboring oar there um, that you often don't see in trials, especially when you have a deep pocketed defendant. You normally see uh, more of a division of labor. So I thought that was impressive. I think he's a bright guy. I think he has a pleasant way about him, but. You know what? The, the probably the most important thing is how you relate to a jury. And I'm not from Tallahassee. I don't have any sense for the jury pool. I was not in the courtroom. I don't know if he was reading the room correctly. I know Joel, you've you've given your opinions on on the jurors and how they were reacting and 
how his style may not have been congruent with um, the style down in Tallahassee. So ultimately, I think on its face, he, he did a good job. He was very prepared. Um, and as far as the theory goes, look, we talked about this already on this show myriad times. He had to come up with something. He had to come up with something, right? He couldn't just undercut the credibility of the prosecution witnesses. Everything pointed towards guilt. He had to come up with a theory. Um, and this is what he came up with. It was ludicrous, but I don't know how many better ones there were out there. So I thought he did a good job. Long so that the theory was Charlie's. I'm pretty sure he came up with it himself. Well, you, you broke up a touch there, Karen, but I think you were saying you thought uh, you think the theory was Charlie's. Is that what you're saying, Karen? Right. It, it feels to me that Charlie came up with that defense himself and Rashbaum inherited it and maybe did the best he could, uh, given the story he was instructed to use. It's, I mean, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that Charlie came up with that one. Uh, and that seems plausible. Because um, Rashbaum came yeah. up with that one. You know. Yeah. Um, here's uh, another clip, and then uh, we'll talk about a couple more, and we'll wrap her up. Um, here's another clip from courtesy of Court TV. Say that Charlie, your brother, this defendant, had explored all options to resolve the problem, including hiring a hitman, and it would cost either fifteen or fifty thousand dollars. No. And did you have a conversation with Jeffrey Lacoste at your residence that night where you said you wanted to share something in confidence with him? No. Did you ever say that your brother had seriously hired a hitman where it, you weren't repeating the joke? You no. were serious. Tim Jansen, um, people testified that she had said that. What say mm -hmm. you? Well, Twofold. She probably already knew what the answer was going to be. So she wasn't expecting her to admit it. She was throwing that out there because she wanted that jury to know what she thought. She wanted the jury to hear what she thought. So by denying it and not answering in the affirmative, Georgia made her point. Her point was, you did say this. You did. He did want to hire a hitman. You told people this. Regardless how much you deny it, I'm going to tell this jury. I want them to hear it. I want you to deny it. So she made her point. Um, I think it was very effective. Uh, Wendy came across as a liar. She, her, her body language is, has always been horrible. Uh, it's never been good. Um, and, and people don't find her credible. They really don't. Her laughing at times. She mocked George one time, said, you're not going to charge me. You're not going to indict me. I didn't do anything. That's right. Georgia hates her. And I mean, she hates her to the degree I haven't seen Georgia hate someone that much in a trial that that's why I have reservations, because if Georgia had any if she was 51 making a decision to go, I think Georgia would go. But I think Georgia, for some reason, and Jack, for some reason, has have waited to pull the trigger on Wendy. And I don't know the reason. I don't know that and maybe they have more. Maybe Donna will give more. But there's no love loss between Georgia and Wendy. That's for sure. Uh, from Karen to Karen here. Why did Wendy Adelson say she was relieved that her petition to move was denied? I don't understand the strategy there. Do you have any thoughts on this, Karen? I mean, it shows some arrogance, uh, first of all, because there was almost nothing, nobody in Wendy's circles when she lived here in Tallahassee that uh, that would, would possibly believe that she was relieved about that motion. Um, and then secondly, I think, uh, I mean, it was just she had to minimize motive. And so she was protecting her family because protecting her family was protecting herself. Uh, so by suggesting that she didn't want to leave, she was minimizing the state's theory. You know, Joel, uh, on, on, go ahead. On this, Joel, and I agree 100 percent with Karen on, on the minimizing of the theory to insulate the family and to debunk the whole premise of the state's case. But this is one where they could really nail her on because unlike the Lacasse ones we saw earlier where, where it is to some degree, he said, she said with a little bit of buttressing in between on this one, she probably told 50 people that she hated Tallahassee. She probably told a hundred people, anyone in her circle could mm -hmm. rebut the premise that she was somehow relieved 
that relocation is denied. This is one they could get her on through um, a number of different people in her circle, because I'm sure she told every single person that would listen, um, and this is what Jeff LaCasse said, that how much she hated Tallahassee. Uh, the COE, by the way, uh, these are not easy to do. She makes all the graphics. Like I said, Space Coast, COE, Steve, it takes a tremendous amount of work. So um, we haven't gone through a bunch. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is kind of a round table and fire through a few more, and then we will get final thoughts. So uh, here's another one, fact-checking Wendy Adelson. Wendy denied that relocation was very important to her. That uh, we just discussed. So let's go on to this one. Um, let me pull that up. I can move my what's going on here. I'm not a tech person. Changing names. Wendy claimed she gave the Markells written notice before changing the boy's last name. Fact check. She didn't. Tim Jansen uh, in a court of law. Uh, is this something that would pan out in terms of the perjury uh, angle? Well, that would be something that would have been easy, easily proved by the other parties. She could have the proof by documenting she gave notice, which I doubt she did. Uh, the Markles are probably going to say they didn't know, and they found out only afterwards. Uh, this is clearly something that it's not a he said, she said. I think it's more more valid for a possible perjury. Uh, and just remember, perjury is not that great. It's, it's hard to prove. Um, if you look at the, the shooting down in Fort Lauderdale, the deputy, right? The deputy at Parkland. They couldn't get him for anything else, so they charged him with perjury. Okay, he went to trial, and he actually won. Um, but that deputy probably has a lot more goodwill in that community than Wendy does in Tallahassee. So uh, it may not be appetizing a perjury charge. If you charged it, Wendy would probably have to defend herself. She'd have to testify without immunity, and possibly she says something that could lead to other charges. Um, you know, we're all just spitballing here. Um, and, you know, my, my, my position has always been the same. It, 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 why haven't they charged Wendy? Why haven't? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Black Widow, a uh, very generous gifting the surviving the survivor membership. Uh, Black Widow, every time there's something wrong with my phone or my computer, my wife immediately says it's the settings. It's always the settings. <laughs> Every time I say your name, she goes, it's Widor. I go, I know I said black Widor. She goes, no, you didn't. You said black widow. I said, no, I didn't. I said black Widor. So I just want you to know what goes on in the Waldman home and uh, <laughs> the, cont the contentious atmosphere revolving around your name. Um, John Singer got to toss the bar mitzvah one to you. Uh, you're getting kids close to that age. I better be invited. Wendy claimed the Markells were invited and allowed to attend Ben's Bar Mitzvah. Fact check. The Markells were uh, uninvited after Charlie's arrest. Big deal, not a big deal. Hey, Windsor. I mean, big deal to the Markells and big deal to me because it shows the venom that she had. I mean, my understanding is she invited them. And then when Charlie got um, arrested, she uninvited them, which just shows how nefarious and cruel a person she is. But I don't think this is the strongest perjury um, uh, charge they would have against her because th this is more, this is not a deception. This, this is not a misrepresentation as much as it's an omission. Um, she did invite them. They were allowed to attend and then they were uninvited. So she omitted something on that. That's not going to be enough to get her on perjury, but it does show her character or lack thereof. Karen Cyphers, Wendy denied telling Jeff Lacoste, her ex-boyfriend, that Charlie really did look into Hitman. We already talked about this. Let's move it along. This is the final one here for Karen. Uh, Wendy claimed her book was not about Tallahassee and wasn't based on her own life. She admits that it was in her in her book. Well, so obvious. I will, obvious I will, I'm about to admit something that I don't want to admit, which is I read that book. Um, <laughs> How was I it? Can't, oh, <laughs> I can't get those hours back. Um, Karen Cyphers, I mean, promise me you're going to read my book, please. I will read. I will read your book, Joel. Thank you. Um, thank you. Her her book was awful, and I'm not saying that because of who I think she is as a person. I think the book was just objectively very bad. Uh, but but there is like there is no doubt that book was about Tallahassee, living here, knowing the geography, knowing the people, knowing the culture. Right. 
It was not even, it was almost like not even attempted to veil it. The fact that she could get up there and say it wasn't about Tallahassee. And then to say that it wasn't based on her life, she claimed in this last trial that it was based on a friend. In the actual afterward, in the published book, she writes, I selfishly wanted you to know some of my story. Uh, and goes on to describe how she is the model for the character Lily, who does almost nothing other than condescend Tallahassee and uh, try to get away from her Montreal-born professor husband to forge her own path and get out of the godforsaken city. So um, I think that I means, I don't know. I don't know if that's perjury, but it was definitely, you tell me. Mm. A glamorous girl, two drinks before dinner. Who drinks two drinks before dinner? Jeffrey Lacasse was spot on when he drinks. Her. I will never ask John Singer that question. <laughs> John looks um, John, John looks confused. Luckily, his I, bar is not right behind. Go I ahead, John. One thing Karen said I thought was fascinating, and this was the first trial where Georgia weaved in the book, um, mm -hmm. and she just did it for fun. I mean, I think it was a lot of fun for her because Hiawatha Springs or whatever it was called or – North Florida State University. I mean, it was clearly about Wendy. It was clearly about Dan. It was clearly a stop on the way back to civilization, which is the exact quote she used in her closing argument. But weaving that in was such a F you to Wendy. It was beautiful to watch. I really, that was one part of the cross I really enjoyed. So uh, for those who do not know, John Singer is uh, an amazing attorney and an amazing person. And he knows all the New England Patriots uh, miscellaneous, useless information from 1967 on. Uh, what he doesn't do is live just a mere mile or two from Tom Brady, uh, albeit different zip codes, but I live near him. And so I know John is jealous of that, but what can you do? Um, Olana with a $5 super sticker here. Uh, this is an interesting way to go out tonight, I think, make everyone a little more uncomfortable than everyone already is. Uh, Donna will fold on her son to save her daughter and grandchildren and will try to make it end. I doubt, hope she will succeed. John Singer um, had former inmates on who are some of the smartest people I ever talked to because they've got street smarts. Um, they think that the entire family is going to start to point fingers and rip each other apart. What sort of scenario do you see? of some sort of plea deal does donna turn on charlie does charlie turn on donna does charlie turn on wendy uh what what possible scenario do you see here uh, i i've always been skeptical about i mean there, there are people who are totally the adelsons are devoid of character but the one thing they're not lacking is loyalty to one another so I, i'd be shocked if donna turned on charlie while his appeals are pending or ever turned on wendy um charlie would be the most likely one um to flip on on wendy but again I, i'm i'd be very curious to hear what karen and and tim think about um donna whether she'll actually make it to trial and what possible defense could she ever tender or do you want to table that for a different show no i want to do it right now i just want to uh outro karen ciphers uh Appreciate her being on the show. Uh, she's been on before. She's a close friend of the Markell family. She's co-manager of the advocacy group Justice for Dan Markell. Karen is also a PhD in public policy with a full-time faculty uh, position at Florida State University. She's also a partner at Saks Media. Um, I like this comment from Penny Fortin. Isn't it ironic that Charlie and Donna are stuck in Tallahassee while Wendy's in South Beach? Whereas Wendy was stuck in Tallahassee while well, Donna and Charlie were in South Beach, LOL. Uh, the only ones probably not laughing at that are the Adelsons themselves. Excellent show. Bring Karen back. Uh, Karen Cyphers, what about John Singer's um, point? Uh, do you think that Donna makes it to trial here? Also, do you think that the family turns on each other? I don't I don't really have a gut sense about Donna making it to trial, I think. You know, the, the Adelsons turning on each other is something that I think about from like almost a like game theory point of view or prisoner's dilemma, you know, the why. And I guess I, I always return to why wouldn't they have already? Why, why as Wendy, would you not have already uh, saved yourself? You've been, she's been in the crosshairs for a really long time. And I think it comes back to the fact that she can't. Um, and I think if she could have saved herself and saved her reputation, she would have a long time ago. Uh, one thing that we know about Charlie from his former friends, current friends, is that he keeps he keeps dirt on everybody. 
Um, and this is something that we see written, you know, people have talked about this a lot. And I, I imagine Wendy probably worries that uh, if she were to have betrayed Charlie, he would be able to return the favor very swiftly. So they're sort of locked in. It's almost like the image of a, a person wearing like a detonating vest. If she fires a bullet at Charlie, they all go down. And, I, and that's sort of the only reason I can imagine why she hasn't been more forthright sooner and why she would intentionally mislead juries and throw a lot of people under the bus and point fingers and lead investigators down weird trails. And so I guess my closing thought is um, of all of the things that she has said that are just so demonstrably false, the one that stings the most was just a few weeks ago when she said the Markells get to see the boys whenever they want. And so my passion for this case and what we I come back to for it is uh, there are still our two boys who are locked away from their dad's family. Um, and as long as that's the case, I, you know, I'm, I'm so inspired by all the folks, everybody on this screen, everybody off the screen, investigators, prosecutors who keep who keep their hearts in the game, because that's really what it's about. Uh, what does a Timex, wa Timex watch and Tim Jansen have in common? They take a beating and keep on ticking. <laughs> Tim Jansen will not be deterred. Um, he is a famed Tallahassee defense attorney. He's handled all kinds of civil administrative and crim criminal litigation. Also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. This is an interesting question from Tina Mindful. Is Wendy still in the United States? If I was her, I joked about this with Donna before she got arrested. I would have been on a canoe over to Cuba. I think I said a rowboat. But um, Tim Jansen, you know Tallahassee. Do you think there's eyes on Wendy now pending a, any kind of possible legal repercussions from all this? I don't know that. I haven't heard that. Um, it wouldn't be surprising. But, you know, is Donna going to flip on on Wendy? Uh, I think we all know what Donna had already decided. Donna was either going to flee or commit suicide. She had already decided her life was over. She was taking her her, and her husband's assets and they were putting him probably in an irrevocable trust for the grandkids. So if they got sued, um, that the, the kids will get the money so she could be forever in their good graces because she's going to give them money. Um, Charlie, I don't think we got the same problem we had with Mag Bonoa. He went to trial. He testified. He gave a bullshit story, story that is not truthful, complete, full of lies. And if he wanted to flip on Wendy, then they're going to have to do a proffer. Then they're going to have to rehabilitate this guy. And is it worth it when you know this guy's the one that paid the hitman? Um, that's a tough question for Jack. That's a conversation I'll probably have to have with the Markels because, you know, when you start giving a deal to someone that, you know, paid for hitman to kill your son to get the wife, they're going to have involvement because the victims under Marcy's law require that. Um, I don't know where Wendy is. I don't know where Harvey is, but I know that the, the case is ongoing. I know if Jack and, and Georgia, they got the momentum and they've got the momentum on their side. And if they can bring charges, hopefully they will. And this discussion we're having tonight, we all could be on the same page and we all can talk about how Wendy's going down. Um, that's the conversation we should be having. It's for the Markels and for those grandkids. Uh, well said, Tim. One final thing the COE just had uh, it up and then we'll wind down with this comment. Um, and I just forgot what the last comment was, COE. How come you did that to me? How dare you? Uh, let me think about that for one quick second. It had, ah, oh, there we go. Too much public pressure. I knew it would come back to me. Uh, Wendy goes down. Tim, is there anything to that? Is there anything about, you, you've handled really high profile cases in Tallahassee. Is there anything, uh, in addition to the fact that John and ev everyone else talked about the sort of the hatred that Georgia Kappelman and uh, we're going to try to get George on the show. Obviously she, she's not gonna be able to do it if there's a pending trial with Donna, but when we can, we will. Um, but is there something to this notion of public pressure and sort of forcing an indictment down someone's throat as a result of that? You know, it can be in some cases, but not in a murder case. Not we've got so much on the line because you got double jeopardy issues. The last thing Jack Campbell, Georgia, and Sarah want is to go forward and they lose, get a not guilty, because then they'll, it'll be for not. They'll live with that for the rest of their lives. They've been patient. They've effectively gotten to almost everybody involved. Um, but public pressure in different kind of cases, sure. 
I represented so many athletes. I can tell you that, you know, public pressure against athletes is really hard in sexual battery cases, date rape cases. Pressure is going to be hard. Even when the state attorney realizes they got a very bad case, they will let the victim have their day in court. That's not this case, okay, because it's not a sexual battery case. This is a murder case, and the stakes are so high. Hmm. Uh, this Katie Cool lady, friend of the show, friend of mine, uh, he did my, hey, did my question get answered? Karen Cyphers, I'm going to toss to toss this to you. The boys are considered victim's family. Uh, can Donna not contact them? Uh, at the first appearance, the judge said she couldn't have any contact with potential witnesses or victims. Does that include the grandchildren? as far as you know? I have no idea what, what the law says on that. I mean, that's a better question for Tim and John, but I know that certainly those boys are the victims here. Tim Jansen, what do you know about I, that? I agree. I agree that they could make a good point. Georgia and Sarah can make a good point that she can't have any communication with them. And why would you? Well, you want talking to her while she's in jail? I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, listen, tomorrow, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, uh, the truth is on Georgia's side from Faticus. There was another comment that really this is about the Markells. Um, I'm constantly in contact with Ruth, uh, Phil and Shelly. Uh, very good people. Um, obviously been, as I've said many times before, to hell and back. Uh, it finally appears that they're getting some justice. Thank you, COE, Maj, Joel, John, RTJ. Oh, that's Tim Jansen. I was like, what's our? And Karen, great show. Joel, informative panel. Obviously a little friction. Glad we got that out of the way. You're never going to hear about it on this show again. Uh, it is in our rear view mirror. That is how Carm, my beautiful mother, survived. That's what I'm writing about in the book. She makes decisions. She, she says what she has to say, and she moves forward. With that said, 5.30 tomorrow for the Markells. Until then, love you, America. Got to get my show closed here. Love you, Tallahassee, Boston. New England, Manhattan, but Tallahassee more than that tonight, John Singer.